ओम अज्ञान ज्ञानंजन शलाकाय चक्षुरीत यस्म श्री गुरव नम Today I am going to speak about human rights and other rights and responsibilities. Shila Prabhupad uh, was the first Vedic acharya to preach the message of Bhagavad Gita and Shrimad Bhagavatam, the Vedic message, in a cultural setting far removed from. that of india which has been largely shaped by vedic knowledge and tradition so naturally shila prabhupad uh, had to address various issues concerning the civilization or lack of civilization the ethos in which shila prabhupad was uh, preaching krishna consciousness is krishna consciousness obviously means consciousness of krishna uh, we all have consciousness we are all conscious and our consciousness is formed around various concepts ideas uh axioms which we often accept um yeah as axioms without even thinking about them uh various world views shaped by various philosophers shaped by our family and in the modern age by uh tv television <coughs> the educational system and so on so uh one uh principle or idea or theory that is actually uh i believe in the american constitution you probably know it off by heart i think in america you are required to learn that at school is it off by heart is it not that everyone has to know no but uh anyway i believe uh, it's a principle in the uh american constitution that all men have equal rights i think the original word was men which which previously when it was said men it used to include women also but then recently there's been uh a move to make the english language less um male chauvinist pig oriented so uh that it it is an self evident <clears throat> fact said thomas jefferson the original hippie that all men are have uh, equal rights human rights and its con- human rights is considered s- practically sacred and for the s- for the sake of establishing human rights that was one of the main uh, excuses for the uh, grand old army of uncle sam namely the us army to uh, invade iraq and if or actually chronologically speaking afghanistan and iraq sorry if i'm hurting you nationalistic feelings here but uh, to establish democracy and human rights and all this kind of thing so uh, you know if you don't believe in human rights well we'll bomb you until you do kind of like that so human rights um this is one of the many topics or or concepts that shila prabhupad addressed and had to address in his worldwide preaching of christian consciousness here is uh, i'm i'm going to read an extract from shila prabhupad speaking in a conversation in mayapur on february the 14th 1977 about human rights shila prabhupad said what is human right that we can explain the human right is here is an opportunity to understand god you see prabhupad takes a completely different angle on it to that of the 
materialists. So this society, namely the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, this society is giving that knowledge. If you don't give the human being the right of understanding God, then he's animal. You keep him as animal. The animal doesn't require. Neither is it capable of understanding what is God, what is his relationship with God, what is his duty. He cannot understand. It is only the human being who can understand. And if you keep him in ignorance like dogs and hogs, that's a great harm to the human society. He got the opportunity. You don't give him. You withdraw the opportunity. What kind of civilization? By nature's way, you have come to the position of understanding why you are suffering, how this material nature is working. I am eternal. Why am I undergoing birth and death? If you do not understand this problem, then what is the value of this human life? Eating, sleeping, mating, that is done by the animals. And this modern civilization, keeping them in ignorance, that eating, sleeping, better style of eating, and that is advancement. And that is also not better style. Eating meat, keeping slaughterhouse, is that better style of eating. End of quote. Um, now, in Vedic culture, or actually in all traditional cultures throughout the world, uh, the Vedic culture has much in common with all traditional cultures throughout the world. Um, the Vedic culture was all over the world at one point, we understand. So, uh, human rights are not emphasized. Human responsibility is emphasized. It's not that there's no concept of human, human rights. I mean, it's... It, but responsi responsibility is emphasized. It's just like in modern secular society... Human responsibility, it's not that it's not there, but human rights are emphasized. Whereas, whereas in, we don't hear much about human responsibility. We hear a lot about human rights. But in Vedic culture, there is one's responsibility. And we see that the two uh, great works, uh, literary works, epics, Ramayana and Mahabharata, that have shaped uh, Indian culture. And when I say Indian culture, it means actually not even up to the present day, uh, the mindset of Muslims and Christians, what to speak of the Hindus, and of course also the Parsis, Sikhs, Jains, and a few Buddhists that might be there. Uh, it, it's also very much, they're also, due to being in this cultural ethos, they're also influenced by the uh, understanding or concept what has come through of dharma, which is prominent in Ramayana and Mahabharata. We see that Rama and Yudhishthira, they are always uh, concerned with doing the right thing according to dharma. So there's the idea of responsibility, that there is a higher authority, there is a higher order who we are all answerable to, we have to act responsibly. Whereas, um, <clears throat> uh, in the, the idea of human rights, that's more concerned with, it, with, with, res, with the responsibility and performing responsibility and duty. These two words in English come out uh, of the, how one is supposed to act according to dharma. So, uh, this concept nourishes in the culture that promotes it uh, a sense of understanding that we are answerable to and dependent on a higher world order that we have to act responsibly for, us, uh, for ourselves and for others, for the benefit of ourselves and for others. Whereas the idea of human rights, it emphasizes more the individual. And although the uh, human rights that's supposed to be for freedom of speech and uh, 
freedom of action within certain limits, of course, uh, freedom of movement within certain limits. But uh, it's come to mean increasingly the, the freedom to perform activities for one's own sense gratification. That one should have freedom to do uh, as whatever you like, as the, the understanding is, is, as long as it doesn't harm anyone, you can do whatever you like. And so what was previously considered sinful, um, to use that example which I often use, as it uh, seems to me to be gross, although in the present day it's become considered normal, is that of homosexuality, or, or any actually any illicit sexual, any non-religious sexual act. Um, it's so, well, it doesn't harm anyone, so if you like to do it, it doesn't harm anyone, then what's the harm? And of course, as Srila Prabhupada notes here, keeping slaughterhouses, that's so, well, that doesn't harm anyone, just kill a few animals, what does it matter? Uh, so, uh, we enjoy the taste of the meat and the animals, it doesn't matter about them. So, uh, one concept is based on what you are supposed to do and the other is on what you are allowed to do, what you can get away with. One of them directly, that, that of responsibility, directly acknowledges that there is a higher power to which we are uh, subordinate and answerable. That if we act irresponsibly or sinfully, that we'll be punished for that. And similarly, if we act responsibly and piously, we'll be rewarded for that. Uh, the concept of human rights is it puts human beings first, but actually that is also, if you think about it, it's also a metaphysical principle in as much as why, why should all humans be considered equal? Why should they have equal rights? I mean, the idea that all human <laughs> All humans are equal is obviously not true in practically any way because everyone has different bodily size, height, weight, different uh, opinions, different uh, intellectual abilities, different abilities in all kinds of different arts and crafts such as sports and uh, you know, someone is a brilliant football player, someone is hopeless at football and someone is uh, good at knitting someone is good at sewing someone is good at skiing someone is good at uh, carpentry in Vedic culture the Brahmana is considered superior to the carpenter but if you want to get a table made you don't ask the Brahmana the carpenter is better than the Brahmana in doing his own duty so uh, no two people are equal practically in any way. Uh, they're not exactly equal, and usually they're quite different in many ways. We see different kinds of personalities. So the idea that all human beings are equal is actually a metaphysical principle. On, on what basis? It's, it's neither bodily nor mental. Uh, there's an understanding, it's not pronounced or it's not explicit, that there's an understanding that actually we, every human being, is uh, a being of intrinsic worth beyond the body and the mind. So indirectly it acknowledges that all human beings are non-material. Indirectly. So... Um, Srila Prabhupada, his understanding of human rights is that all human beings should be given the opportunity to understand God. If you don't, they're talking about rights. We have a right to free speech. We have a right to have sexual activities, whatever we like. We have a right to, uh, well, originally this concept of equal rights was very much, uh, or, or human rights was very much that you can uh, practice religion as you like because uh, some of the first settlers from Europe in America, uh, they were mostly uh, religious refugees 
fleeing from persecution in Europe because they they belonged to some church which uh, in Europe they were being persecuted for their beliefs. Although interestingly, when in the, in the middle of the 19th century many Catholic settlers came to America, then the the, the Protestants who had been the settlers in America and whose uh, human their exercise of human rights had uh, led to this decimation of the uh, previous inhabitants of America, the, what, are the, what they now call the Native Indians. They, they just slaughtered them en masse, what to speak of the bison, and later on the passenger pigeon. They just wiped out species. Um, but when the Catholics came, then they, 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 there was a lot of opposition to that. So... Uh, this idea that they, they say human rights, but it, it becomes hypocritical if we don't actually understand what a human is. So Srila Prabhupada makes the point here that a real human is one who is exercising the right of understanding God. If one is not doing that, then he's an animal. As we know, uh, Srila Prabhupada kindly taught us from Hitopadesh that Ahara Nidra Bhaya Maitunamcha Samanyame Tat Pashu Bhyanaranam Dharmo Hitesham Adhiko Vishesham Dharmena Hina Pashu Bhyanaranam That humans and animals both eat, sleep, mate and defend. The special prerogative of human life is dharma. So if a human life does not practice dharma, then he's just an animal. So uh, the right to vote, sorry, oh, no, I forgot about that. Oh, and another important point, when all men are created equal, but then there was the question of the black slaves. They were not considered men, they were just considered slaves. So there was a lot of hypocrisy, actually. I'm just pointing that out on the side. When I talk about human rights, there's a lot of hypocrisy and um, many people in modern America and other places also have recognized that hypocrisy and have attempted to uh, rectify that. Uh, that was attempted starting practically from the, seriously from the 1960s with the civil rights movement and then the blacks who are no longer slaves, they got what well, is supposed to be equal rights and then there was the feminist movement and now there's the gay movement and gradually all humans are getting equal rights. So the right to vote and all this kind of thing. But Srila Prabhupada said that the, the real right of human right is to understand God. And if you keep people in ignorance by promoting sense gratification, then you're denying human beings the real purpose of their life. And practically we see that uh, modern society is based on sense gratification. And especially uh, in America, we often, often say America because it's like the leading the world in all of this, although other places are quite advanced, such as uh, most of Western Europe, the Western world in general, um, in sense gratification, highly sinful sense gratification. But according to Srila Prabhupada here, and actually it's a fact, of course, that people are being kept in ignorance like dogs and hogs, and that's a great harm, Srila Prabhupada says, to the human society. <coughs> the human society is meant for cultivating God consciousness. Labdva sudur labham idang bahusam bhavante manusham arthadam anityam apihadhira turnam yatetana patedanum ritya yava nishrayasaya Vishaya Kalu Sarvatasyat. This human life is very rarely attained, but any one of you who can understand what I'm saying, you've attained it, because the animals can't understand what is being discussed. They cannot understand uh, topics of God consciousness. So one who has this human life, he should consider 
that I've been born and died many times and I'm going to die again soon and before I die, this time, I should utilize this human form of life, uh, which is the only opportunity in which it can be done, to cultivate that understanding by which I will not have to be born again. We don't have much time, but use it now. Otherwise, uh, sense gratification is available in all species of life, so to pursue it in human life is a uh, misuse of human life and a dereliction of duty. So, um, Srila Prabhupada says, uh, we should ask these questions. I am eternal. Why am I undergoing birth and death? If you do not understand this problem, what is the value of this human life? What is eating, sleeping, mating, that is done by the animals. So, uh, in the modern, in the modern world, a country or a civilization is, is considered most advanced by its ability to engage in sense gratification, by the facilities it provides the citizens for sense gratification and for working hard for sense gratification. At present in India, there's, uh, the government is developing the infrastructure, uh, the rail infrastructure is already there, largely due to the British, it was expanded, but road infrastructure is going on. We, we didn't have these flyovers and six-lane highways in India until Padley. It only just started about ten years ago. And uh, so many cars. So there's so much infrastructure. Is there these uh, towers everywhere for the... Uh, what's that for? For uh, microwave t- towers for cell phones and internet and all that. What's it called? What kind of towers? What are they called? Don't know. Cell phone towers? Is that what they're called? So uh, that was that infrastructure has been put up recently, uh, and making huge industrial projects. Uh, that's all going on. That infrastructure is being built up so that people can work hard, so that they can purchase all kinds of items for sense gratification. So uh, this is a misdirected civilization, and Srila Prabhupada his. Uh, brilliantly insightful uh, comment on human rights is, as typical of Srila Prabhupada, uh, completely different, coming in from a completely different perspective to that of what any materialistic person could even think about, because Srila Prabhupada is seeing from the perspective of the absolute truth. Uh, which is a different perspective. Yanisha sarva bhutanam yasyam jagrati sangyami. What's the next line? Tasyam jagrati sangyami. Sanisha pasyuto What's black and white? What is bl- black for the devotee is white for the materialist and vice versa. What is night for the materialist is day. It completely different perspective which uh, materialistic people find difficult to understand they, they just presume that human life is meant for sense gratification so um, we should discuss among ourselves follow Srila Prabhupada's example and discuss these points uh, how we can present to modern man the uh, Vedic understanding. Some more points about this. Yeah, as Srila Prabhupada says, we're talking about human rights. But first of all, you should become human. According to the uh, Vedic conception, unless you follow these four regulated principles, you're not even a human being. You're, you're a Dvipada Pashu. You have two legs, but you're actually an animal, like a gorilla or a chimpanzee, something like that. Actually, the chimpanzee is also a vegetarian, so in some ways he's more of a human being than, than you. We should consider also, talking about our rights, what is the extent of our rights? You say, I, I demand the right to blah, 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 whatever it may be. I, my right as a citizen of this country... But we cannot demand the right not to die. 
for instance, we are forced to relinquish this body. We cannot demand that uh, I want a strong, healthy, beautiful body. We cannot demand happiness. We are extremely limited. We are controlled. So it's actually, uh, yeah, we are controlled by nature. It's like I say, you, well, by modern technology, you can change a, an ugly face into a less ugly face. You can even, if you have a very black skin and you don't like it, you can turn it to white skin, as did uh, Michael Jackson. But of course, he had to die also. He couldn't demand the right not to be alive. You may say, I don't like being a woman, I'll become a man. And you can change by a sex change operation and vice versa. But nevertheless, we are extremely limited. We Actually, we do have a right not to die. How about that? People want the right to vote or the right for free speech or the right to have sex with whichever uh, object that uh, whichever other body uh, doesn't protest when they do so. But how about this? You have the right not to die. You have the right to have an eternal, beautiful, uh, blissful form. Now, the, the, any government or educational system that doesn't teach us that, they are cheating us. People, are, they want their rights, but you don't know that you have a right not to die. But you have to act in such a way to deserve that right. Just like to have the right of uh, freedom of movement, you have to act as a responsible citizen. Otherwise, you get put in the jail. Then you don't have the right to freedom of movement. Uh, your rights are severely curtailed in prison. You don't have the right to do uh, what you, you can't go out to a cinema, you can't go out to a restaurant, your rights are severely curtailed. And there's a reason for that. But actually, people don't know that we have the right to live forever. But the uh, modern leaders, they themselves don't know this. And they're not teaching us that. So we should preach human rights. Our Krishna conscious movement stands for human rights. But we will give a concept of human rights that you cannot even imagine in your present, uh, with your present restricted consciousness. We, there's a right, there's a, it's underst <coughs> understood that everyone has a right to education. But that's how, actually, the way that's going on in modern society is actually also cheating. Because the modern education is just to make you a pawn in, a, in an economic system where, where you're just exploited, that's all. But the real education is God-conscious education, for which uh, it's not required that everyone get a, tech, a, a school education. As I was just reading this morning, Prabhupada said, children at the Hydra, around the Hyderabad farm Prabhupada said to start a school and the devotee was asking about teaching them English in the villages of Andhra Pradesh actually that village it was like 40 kilometers outside Hyderabad now 40 years later it's in Hyderabad it's an, hour, an hour's journey it used to be now it's much more than an hour's journey to Hyderabad but anyway, Srila Prabhupada said, if you teach them English, they want to teach the children, the children English, and then they want to, then they'll leave the village and go to the city and get a technical job. Prabhupada said, why, why do they need to learn English? Let, they, they don't, he said, the Shudras, they don't require education. They have to plow, that's all. So Srila Prabhupada wasn't for education for everyone, but he wanted everyone to get the education of how to get free from birth and death, how to live happily, eternally, with Krishna. So you, the right to education, yes, <coughs> but the right to education, <coughs> how we can be free from birth and death. That is real education. And for that it's not required to have this technical education just so that you can earn some money. Uh, you think you have a good job uh, for every 
rupee you earn, you're earning 100 rupees for the person who's employing you, and you think you have a good job. So, uh, in the discussion of human rights also, Srila Prabhupada also pointed out that what they call civilization is eating meat and keeping slaughterhouses. They talk about human rights. Why only human rights? What about rights for the animals? What right have you got to torture the animals and kill them just so you can eat them? When it's, when there's sufficient vegetarian food around. So what about animal rights? There are animal rights activists. People are trying to stop all this uh, unnecessary slaughter of animals. And there's even plants rights. Srila Prabhupada is very insistent. We don't cut any trees unless necessary. Just like both in our Vrindavan temple and in the Bombay temple, uh, there are trees in the courtyard. It's not exactly as a decor for decoration, but they were there before the temple was to be built and Prabhupada said, keep them, don't cut them down. They're already there. Why cut the tree down? And you'll find in uh, Hare Krishna land in Juhu, there are trees which are they're practically in the road, so the cars have to drive around. And that's because Prabhupada said, don't cut them down. He didn't want any trees cut down unnecessarily. <coughs> so there are movements in the world for animal rights and for preserving the, uh, the environment, ecological movements, but the the full uh, understanding of that is that uh, everything belongs to Krishna. So people ask us, why don't you join the, the Hindu rights movement or the Hindu rights movement or the animal rights movement or the environmental movement? But we can't join so many movements. This one movement, the Krishna conscious movement, if people understand their real duty and responsibility in life, which is to utilize this life for understanding Krishna, uh, serving Krishna, then automatically all other welfare programs will be fulfilled. There won't be this horrible uh, exploitation of nature, which is, in, in India, no, no one cares at all. They'll just, there's so much pollution. Hardly anyone cares at all that people are getting poisoned, here in South Gujarat especially, I mean, just Ankleshra, Bharuj, Baroda, I mean, hmm? Vapi. I mean, that, that area, when you, when you go through it, it just, 24 hours a day, Ankleshra, then Baroda, if you just go a little north of Baroda, the industrial, it just stinks, heavy, bad smell. <coughs> Where I used to live also, I lived for three years in one place in England, that, there was the uh, gas works, and it just stinking. I mean, the whole huge area just stinking. For, uh, I think nowadays they're more uh, in the West. They don't do that. In Russia, you'll go in the cities. You'll find the power stations right in the middle of the city, atomic power station. Uh, that Chernobyl and all that. That is on the border of Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia. So yeah, in England also, uh, in, uh, in between sh at the in Sheffield City, there's a huge power station, right? Nuclear power station, right in the edge of the city. I don't know if they. I was saw it when I was a kid. I don't know if it's been closed down. I mean, if you go on the the motorway, that's like the highway, it goes right past it. I mean, you know, within 50 meters of the cooling towers. So. Uh, So what was I talking about? Environmental uh, concerns. People are concerned about that. In some, in India, not much. That the people are getting poisoned. That the, the food we eat is poisonous. People don't care about that very much. Uh, so, but if we become Krishna conscious, then automatically these matters uh, they become resolved. Just like, for instance, here in India, the pesticides. <laughs> Because the government subsidizes it, and then people put, on average, how much? Five times, ten times, a hundred times more than needed? You don't know exactly, but in India there, they put far more than is needed to kill the pests. So, so people get cancer from eating nice vegetables. Um, 
But in Krishna conscious culture, we don't use pesticides. And actually in India, they, especially in Gujarat, at first it was, no one would use pesticides when these came on the market. Especially in Gujarat, because there's a strong culture of uh, non-violence here in Gujarat, more than, in, more than any other state in India. So, uh, the Krishna conscious outlook is, well, we grow the food, we grow, no, actually Krishna grows it. It all depends on Krishna. And if some birds come and take some, well, they're also children of God, so let them take it. It's just accept it. And if you start interfering with the uh, with nature, then there are severe reactions. Now, now the uh, the population of bees all over the world is just becoming the bees are becoming extinct. Sparrows, the most common bird in the world, all of a sudden their population is just getting wiped out. There may be no more sparrows soon. All of, they don't know why exactly, but Obviously, it's all linked to the to uh, all the uh, callous destruction of the uh, natural environment, which is going on. Uh, and they're having talks, and they talk about decreasing the fossil fuels or decreasing the rate of increase. <laughs> but it's. As they, as the environmentalists themselves know, it's too little, too late. We're, we're heading for ecological disaster. So what should we do? Uh, well, one thing is, devotees ourselves, we can try to, in whatever little way we can, to uh, decrease whatever, uh, just like unnecessarily using power, decrease whatever ecological uh, crimes we, we make. One thing that hasn't come, although the uh, need for ecological consciousness has become very prominent in the Western world, the fact that the, by far the number one pollutant of all industries uh, in the Western world is, the, is the, what they call the meat industry. That's not been widely propagated. So people do things like changing their light bulbs to a to a more uh, energy what's the word saving energy efficient light bulb, but uh, they could save literally hundreds of times more power by stopping eating meat. But they don't publicize that because the meat industry is uh, it's got a lot of muscle money muscle. So all these things are going on. It's very, very complex. Here in India at the present time, uh, it's in the, in the news for the last several months about the, the corruption is being discussed. Big corruption at the, at the highest level. Uh, I don't think anyone's really surprised about it. Is it? No one's surprised. Um, it's been going on. For some time. Um, But all this can be resolved by Krishna consciousness. That is that we want to say. Everyone should be given the right to be Krishna conscious. So actually in our society we should be uh, also uh, following Prabhupada's direction. There should be no corruption. The leaders should be, the leaders of this society should be uh, above suspicion in all ways. Otherwise, the mission of Krishna conscious will be impeded. Anyway, I'm getting a little bit off the subject there. The human right is to understand who we are, what is our relationship with God, why we're suffering in this world. Uh, so our Krishna conscious movement should follow Srila Prabhupada's example and uh, present Krishna consciousness, the uh, pristine science or eternal science of Krishna consciousness as presented in Bhagavad Gita and other uh, shastras for the benefit of human society and inform people what is their real right 
even if you have voting right, freedom of movement, freedom of speech, this right, that right, that right, but still you're being cheated if you don't know that it is your right and your duty. Both. It is your right to uh, have Krishna consciousness and it is your duty as a human being to cultivate that and it is the duty of the leaders, Rajarshis and Brahmanas to uh, give that to human society and organize human society in such a way that people do take to this. So, Hare Krishna. That's all I want to say about that now, unless there are any questions about this. Yes, please. What is the best way to convince people that they have to put more emphasis on responsibility than what we call rights? Well, it's all part of the Krishna conscious package. When the subject of human rights was brought up to Srila Prabhupada, he responded with this. But it's not that uh, we're only going to preach on this. I mean, the basic point is that we are eternal spirit souls. We are not meant to suffer birth and death and old age and disease. So, therefore we should live life in such a way that we can develop this understanding. Jivasya tattva jigyasya. Hmm? What's the word? What's the next line? Hmm? Narto yas cheha karma bihi. One should live for the sake of inquiring into the nature of reality. This verse should be preached. Karma sya nindriya pritir. Yava jiveta yavata. Jivasya tattva jignyasa nartho yas cheha karma bhihi. Life, we should, life is not meant for fulfilling material desires or pursuing material desires. One should live only with this purpose in mind to understand the nature of reality. Uh, this should be the purpose of all works, of all our activities. So if people can understand these points, that we are the, the, the point that Srila Prabhupada presented most to uh, in the Western world especially, that we are we are not the body, we are eternal spirit soul. Then the, uh, that in itself is a revolutionary outlook. And then with that understanding comes, should come the understanding that we should act in such a way that we don't get bodies again and again and again because that is simply suffering. But actually, even from a sociological or a social point of view, we can say that yeah, if people are more concerned about responsibilities than rights, uh, that, that's, a, that's actually a more advanced society. As the famous JFK said, that don't, do not think what your country can do for you, think what you can do for your country. So that principle of selflessness is certainly more noble and elevated than the principle of selfishness. Of course, the idea of human rights is not that one should become selfish. Uh, but practically, that's what it comes down to. If you're always saying about what I, you know, what I can get for myself. That wasn't the, uh, I, I guess that wasn't the original intention. The human rights. That we, we should have the right to speak out freedom of speech. Uh, but it's come to mean that you have the freedom to have as much sense gratification as you can get. It's also, in the name of freedom of speech, uh, they say as long as it doesn't harm others, but actually, in the name of freedom of speech, pornography in all media has become 
allowed and accepted. And they say it doesn't harm others, but and that's highly questionable that it doesn't harm others. <coughs> and it does harm yourself. I mean, that's another point. It does harm the consciousness of the person seeing. You may say, well, that's another strange thing, that the government allows citizens to damage themselves in the name of exercising their rights. People have the right to smoke tobacco, which damages their, their body. Uh, alcohol, people are allowed to drink alcohol, which is, I mean, uh, there's, in the West, there's like probably billions of dollars spent by the governments to stop people smoking marijuana or selling or growing or whatever. Uh, but still it goes on. En masse. It's pri- I mean, I don't, there's probably hardly anyone in, or a very small percentage of the population in America who reaches the age of, say, 15 without having a puff of a joint. You still call them joints? Yeah, that means a marijuana cigarette. From maybe those who grew up in Christian families or something like that, but maybe, I would say, probably at least 80%, doesn't it, of kids by the age of 15? They must have had at least a few puffs. So uh, there's so much, uh, billions of dollars spent to try to prevent that. But actually, alcohol is a much more dangerous drug, much more dangerous intoxicant. Under the influence of alcohol, there are thousands of lives lost every year in America. Not only America, everywhere. In in, uh, motor car and other accidents. And crimes, violent crime by people under the influence of alcohol. So it's uh, hypocritical and unbalanced, you can say. I mean, people shouldn't be allowed to indulge in alcohol use. But as Srila Prabhupada, or misuse, but as Srila Prabhupada pointed out, if you try to prohibit it, then uh, it goes on illegally. And now, of course, that's well known in the history of America. There was the period of prohibition in the 1920s, I believe it was, and that was the time when organized crime became, uh, well, Al Capone especially, because it's a household, household word, household name in America even now, right? Al Capone, 100 years later, for uh, organizing a mafia, for producing and distributing illegal alcohol. So Srila Prabhupada pointed out that, you, well, you can, you can uh, ban it, alcohol, and actually it should be banned, but if people don't have a, a higher consciousness, then they'll get it anyway, illegally. And that's going on in here in Gujarat also, right? Alcohol is officially, sale of alcohol is officially banned, but it's everywhere. There's no problem for anyone to get alcohol, and no one seems to care about it even that much. The, the, the police themselves are probably among the greatest drunkards. I mean, everyone knows. That pol- in India, policemen, well, I don't want to get arrested here, but policeman generally means a drunkard. And so, uh, in Gujarat also, so, where officially alcohol sale is banned, but it's going on illegally. So, raising the consciousness of people to un- to understand the purpose of life, that is required. In Vapi, they probably people just take it from Daman, is it? In Vapi, because it's right next to Daman, where alcohol is, they have a check post. They put it in the headlight of the car. You can't put much in the headlight of the car. But there must be a regular, presumably there's a lot just goes around the board of check post. And then, uh, then you can pay off the, uh, the, per, the, the police or whatever it is at the check post. So he can have a little money to buy his own alcohol. <coughs> so, it's not very effective, the check post, is it? Now they have one check post on the road and for and the kilometers, there's the border running with just open fields, and it's not very effective. 
So, anything else? Yeah. Yeah, life comes through life book. Great, pre- great preaching. That's really revolutionary, isn't it? Life comes from life. Yeah. People firmly believe that the scientists are speaking the truth. Sri Scientist Uvacha. Not in the West. Not in the West. People don't have such faith in the scientists in the West, right? A lot of people think that this... Yeah, yeah. Alternative science or... Uh, Christians especially. Well... They don't like the idea of evolution. Oh, ho, ho. Among the old time. He, Michael Cremo, is that how it's pronounced? Cremo? Yeah, it's many, it's like this. Anyway, Cremo or Cremo, Dutta Karma Prabhu as we know him. He's, he's a big field in the alternative science. Forum, as was Sadar Puta Prabhu, unfortunately, and a great loss to our society. It's unrecognized, uh, un, or under recognized, great contributor to the uh, war against nescience, Sadar Puta Prabhu. So, uh, yeah, you. You should go to their conventions or what are their meetings, these alternative science people. And so one thing, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to meet Dhruta Prabhu in June and one thing that I had to discuss it with, I don't know what exactly the situation is, but he's got these tremendous books which are, they're, they're being tremendously influential. They're not nearly widely enough distributed. That, that hidden history of the human race. Now these, I... <coughs> What I'm going to say now may seem to be very controversial, but of course I'm not new to making controversial statements. But I feel that our movement is almost uh, fanatically fixated on distributing only Srila Prabhupada's books, which wasn't actually Srila Prabhupada's personal desire. He had uh, Suruk Damada Brahmachari at the time, right? The, the scientific base of Krishna consciousness and had it printed by the BBT for mass distribution. Then he had uh, Satsuru Maharaj write the readings in Vedic literature and he wanted his disciples to make many books which address the issues that Prabhupada was talking about in a, in a thorough way and in, and in a manner that is uh, relevant to modern society. So recently the BBT published, unfortunately only 10,000, a book called Darwin, Rethinking Darwin, written by a devotee with uh, uh, ex- with an excerpt, well, one chapter is an excerpt from The Hidden History of the Human Race. One chapter is an excerpt from Michael Behe, who's the, you know, he's bigger than Michael Kramer, he's, he's famous. And he wrote Darwin's Black Box about 30 years ago, maybe, was it, no? That was like the first book which exposed Darwin in the Western world. So, uh, you know, these are the kind, we should be distributing this kind of book. That's what I feel. We should be getting these kind of books out. Doing our, uh, by distributing, uh, definitely Bhagavad Gita should, distribution should go on. Science of Self-Realization, all these books. But we should also distribute books like this, Rethinking Darwin, Hidden History of the Human Race, even Sadar Puta's book that uh, you, on UFOs. We should go to UFO conventions. What's it called? I can't remember. <laughs> Alien Identities. Uh, we should go to the UFO conventions and then people will take them. And it, it, they serve an important purpose of introducing people to the, to the uh, Vedic concepts. Uh, and introducing them in a way which is uh, will will bring them if they can take a next step. The next step is right into Prabhupada's books. 
So, yeah, we should be distributing all these different... I mean, we should write... There should be many, many more books written. Just like here in India. I, I, I always wanted to write, but I have so many books to write and so many things to do. We should have a, b- a book called Sex and the Indian Student. It would sell like anything. And Sex and the Indian Student. It would sell. Every and every young person would buy it. I mean, it it's, just, it's like a, we could have Brahmacharya and Krishna Consciousness with a a version, or, or for for the uh, just change a little bit for the, the and uh, we should have a uh, a message to the the young women of India and tell them how they're being exploited by this modern propaganda. They should follow the old way of Sita and Sati and Savitri, and Madri and Kunti. So all these books should be written answering the atheists and many. <coughs> Many, many books should be written and distributed. We have, by the grace of Srila Prabhupada, we have the knowledge which can save human society. But we shouldn't just become stuck in some kind of Hindu religion box. It's convenient for us to, uh, to become in a Hindu religion box. And they put us, people can mentally package us away in a Hindu religion box. We feel comfortable, they feel comfortable. But it's not our job to be comfortable or to make other people... Our job is to ourselves make others uncomfortable with everything they're thinking, which means that we'll be uncomfortable because they'll react to that. But that's our job. If if they're comfortable with thinking that human life is meant for sense gratification, and if you want to be a Christian and have sense gratification, that's okay. If you want to be an atheist and have sense gratification, if you want to be a Hare Krishna, that's also okay if you like it. But our propaganda should be, no, it's not just for us because we like it. It's meant for everyone. Everyone should understand the purpose of life. So if people, if people feel good about us, we're doing something wrong. That's, that's my understanding. We should, we should be provocatively preaching the message so that people actually think. People think that our devotees are just a bunch of sentimentalists, both, both in India and outside. Even if people like us, they think that we're just sentimentalists. Despite the fact that we've distributed literally hundreds of millions of books, people don't know that we have such a superb philosophy, that we are philosophers. We spend every day in our our temples, we discuss philosophy. People have no idea about this. They just think we're some funny people jumping around on the streets, which itself is a provocative act, going out on Harinam. provoking it, provocative in the sense, I mean, it's not, uh, well, it is in one sense aggressive also. I mean, we're saying that you know, we, there are better things to do than just be a, a, another Joe Blow sense gratifier. This is, this is a better thing to do. So, yeah, we should, I don't agree that we should distribute only Srila Prabhupada's books because I don't, I don't see that it was Prabhupada's own policy and uh, or that or that is what he wanted. Now there's a strong move in India now that they should only sell Prabhupada's books, but again, it's not Prabhupada's policy, and we can better serve his mission by distributing other books also. I agree that we shouldn't distribute the pastimes of Radharani and all this, but we should distribute uh, the scientific basis and the hidden history of the human race and begins. <coughs> Beginner's Guide to Krishna Consciousness and maybe glimpses of traditional Indian life and so many other books also. So, uh, yeah. Speaking of being introduced to Prabhupada's books by his disciples, I actually read Jutta Karnapuru's art, an article by him about archaeology before I even heard of the Hare Krishna movement and convinced me that the answers to life were to be found in the pages. Really? Well, there we have evidence. Vishnu Jam Das from Baltimore? New Jersey. New Jersey. Oh, southern New Jersey or whatever? Central New Jersey. Okay. Uh, by, before he'd even heard of the Hare Krishna movement, he read an article in a secular magazine. <coughs> A secular book, a compilation, a, a compilation in which there was an article by Michael Cremo about archaeology, which convinced uh, 
Vasilios, whatever your name was, that the uh, that the Vedic knowledge has the Vedic knowledge is the ultimate. So just see. Meta came in contact with it. It also speaks of the state of our movement in America that he'd never heard of the Hare Krishna movement. I had an experience about ten years ago on this on, uh, in Dublin, Ireland, <clears throat> on Harinam, and I was distributing flyers, inviting people to the program I was about to address. Uh, and one young lady asked me, "Well, what's this all about?" And I said, "Well, this is the Hare Krishna movement, and uh, we're, we're chanting the names of God." And she she had never heard of the Hare of Hare Krishna. I asked. <coughs> I asked, where are you from? She said, New York City, where it all started in the West. She'd never, she was about, I guess, about 25 years old. She'd never heard of the Hare Krishna movement. And New Yorkers are usually, they pride themselves on being pretty informed about everything, right? Especially New Yorkers. So, yeah, let's get, let's get dynamic and aggressive and, you may think, who am I to say this, just sitting in that room all day, but I'm writing books which they're making a difference. <laughs> Preparing some good bombs. Okay, anything else here? Yeah. Some, some devotees have the opinion that we should present books which are more easily understandable to students. I'm not completely against that, but I don't think we should say only you must not distribute Prabhupada's books. I, I'm not this... You're talking about Radhe Shamprabhu's books, and definitely his books... I mean, I didn't read them, but what is it? Our best friend and mind control. Discover yourself. Uh, they they are topics which students like to read. And you, you yourself came. You first read that. Okay. Well, there's evidence, and there are many others also. But I don't think. I I mean, when I say we should distribute other books, I mean. It's not that we should stop distributing books. People from the very beginning should have the opportunity to take uh, Bhagavad Gita as it is, Science of Self-Realization, and all these other books. It's I, 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 I'm definitely not of the school that thinking that people can't... Prabhupada's, there's another school of thought within our movement that says Prabhupada's books are too difficult, people can't understand them. It's true that they're difficult for the average man to understand, but at the same time, it's also true that by the grace of Krishna, many people have read them and have come to devotional service. In fact, particularly outside of India, uh, or outside of Indian communities, there are so many of them all over the world, whenever we ask people, uh, how did you first come to Krishna consciousness, the reply in almost all cases is by reading one of Srila Prabhupada's books. So these books have their power.